David Wilkerson was a nerdy uh, Pentecostal pastor from uh, Pennsylvania who felt called to go to Manhattan and to witness to the gang members and uh, show them the love of Christ. Uh, God really put a guy named Nicky Cruz on his heart. Nicky Cruz was the leader of the biggest, baddest gang in New York at the time. I think at the time was like 1960. Uh, the name of the gang was the Mau Mau's. There was over 500 members and they ruled the streets of Manhattan through fear and terror. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, hearing Nikki speak, and Nikki said that um, there was there were times that he would just stick someone in the stomach with a knife, and as they're screaming in pain, look in their eyes and laugh as he reached around and took their wallet out of their pocket. Dave Wilkerson seen this kid, Nikki. And uh, thankfully, Dave wasn't a Calvinist Protestant. He was a Pentecostal, so he knew that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son for everybody, not just for the elect. So he knew God had died for Nikki, and he knew the truism that hurt people hurt people. And Nikki was a very hurt kid. At eight years old, his mother abandoned him in New York City, took him from Puerto Rico, and at eight years old, said, you sit here, Nikki. I'm leaving. You are the devil. The devil is in you. You're full of evil, and you'll always be full of evil. And she left him, and Nikki believed her. He was a scared, frightened young child in a cold, hard city, New York City. And he's made his way as a homeless kid by stealing, by robbing, by being ruthless, and then leading a gang, the Mau Mau's. Nikki says one afternoon he got so tired of David Wilkerson telling him that he loved him that the last time David Wilkerson said, I love you, Nikki, Nikki said, I beat the crap out of him. I left him bloody. There was blood all over his face as he laid on the ground. I took out my switchblade and put it next to his face and said, if you tell me you love me one more time, I will slice you up into a thousand pieces and spread you all over New York. And he said, uh, David Wilkerson looked up at him, wiped the blood out of his eyes, and said, Nikki, you could cut me up into a thousand pieces and spread them all over New York, and every piece will shout out, Nikki, I love you. Nikki said that that scared him so much. The love of God was so frightening to him and so far to him that he just ran. And he ran, and he wrote the book, Run, Baby, Run. And he just ran, and finally he ran into the arms of God and was transformed and became a Christian. And like 80% of the Mau Mau's followed him and converted to Christ and went to the New York City Police Department and turned over all their weapons, their guns, their knives, their drugs. And we all know the story of St. Padre, uh, I'm sorry, St. Maximilian Kolbe, during World War II in Auschwitz, when a guard picked 10 guys randomly to starve to death, and one of the guys cried and said, what about my children? What about my wife? Who's gonna take care of them? And Maximilian Kolbe asked the guard, can I die in his place? And Maximilian Kolbe gave his life for this man. Where do these people get this love from? Where do we get this love? How do we get this love? Because if you want joy, remember the acronym. Jesus, others, you. This is true. Put Jesus first, then put others first, and then put yourself. But you can only put others first if you truly put Jesus first. And the way I see it, there's two ways that we do not put Jesus first. And I'll get to one, the first point I'll make, and then I'll get to the second point is really what this video is about. But the first point is some people don't see the need for Jesus. Um, you know, I talked to an older Catholic last week, and she was very sad. And I said, you know, you need to get back in the church. She hasn't been in church in decades. And I said, all you got to do is go to confession, and then you can have the Eucharist. It's a supernatural experience. The whole Mass is a supernatural experience. It will transform your life again. And she said, well, I don't know. I don't do nothing. You know, I don't need to go to confession. <laughs> and I told her the story about um, 
the sinner and the Pharisee in the temple and the Pharisee looking down on the sinner saying, oh, thank you, God, that I'm not like him. I tithe and, and I follow the law and I do everything right. Thank you that I'm a holy man of God and not like this wretched, dirty, unclean sinner. And the sinner beat his breast and couldn't even look up to God because he was so ashamed of his sin and said, God, please forgive me. Jesus said, who do you think, whose prayer do you think God heard? And this person I talked to got to the point. I said, you know, if you didn't need forgiveness, then Jesus died in vain. <laughs> if we could do it on our own, Jesus died in vain. That's, that's blasphemy. Um, I said, so you never sin? You know, the Bible says if you say you're out sin, you're a liar. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So I think most of the people I'm speaking to today know they're sinners, but they're at the other extreme. They feel like maybe they're too much of a sinner, that they can't ever get it right. They can't ever be a saint. Well, you're in good company because St. Paul said in uh, Romans chapter 7, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I keep doing. <laughs> That's our human nature. That's our human nature. And if you back up uh, a couple chapters of chapter 5, he said where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. So should we just keep sinning to get more grace? Well, he says in the next chapter, chapter 6, by no means. <laughs> God forbid. No. You know, Martin Luther didn't understand why James said in the book of James, we're justified by our works and not by our faith alone. So he took that book out and added the word alone into the book of Romans where it says we're saved by faith. He added alone. And since then, scholars, biblical scholars, have put that book back. You know, the book of James is obviously back in the New Testament of Protestants. Uh, and they took out that word alone <laughs> because they knew Martin Luther just put that in. Um, so we are justified by works according to the Bible. However, according to the church, we cannot do any works without the grace of God. It's the grace of God. And there were many Christians that took that verse, you know, early on or took that belief early on. And um, one of them was called Pelagius. And the church condemned that, that we can do things on our own. It's called Pelagianism. And then a few years later, some Christians like try to compromise and, you know, saying, well, and they came up with some doctrine of semi-Pelagianism. Well, you know, it's some of God and some of us. And the church, the Catholic Church condemned that. The Catholic Church condemned Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism. It says, apart from grace, we can do nothing. You know, I heard it said that Mother Teresa on her deathbed said, it's all grace. It's all grace. And so we need the grace of God. But how do we receive this grace of God? Jesus said, if you... Eat my flesh and drink my blood. I will abide in you and you will abide in me. John 6.56 You know, a dog barks because it's a dog. A cat meows because it's a cat. We love because we abide in Christ. Christ in us loves. Christ in us helps us to sacrifice for others. And this is where you find joy. This is where you find happiness. You know, um, there's, be, be, before, I, before I finish, I just want to say this. There are sometimes you have medical conditions that affect your mood. I mean, uh, you know, your thyroid hormones low, your testosterone hormone, your estrogen, you know, and there's doctors that specialize in this, you know. Um, sometimes it's just horrible nutrition and, and bad habits that you need to change to get your hormone levels where they need to be. Um, but it, sometimes it's your mind. You know, when I, when I talk about the mind-body connection, people think, oh, you're getting new age. You know, a lot of Christians get, like, nervous. And I'm like, just, no, God made us, you know, a soul, a spirit, and a body. We're a soul, which is your mind, and a body with a spirit and when we're baptized that spirit is born again and the spirit is willing but the mind the flesh the soul is weak so jesus can transform our minds through the reading of the word and 
through the Holy Spirit being alive in us. But we're always going to have that battle. And it's like, what came first? The chicken or the egg? If your body, you know, if you're feeding your body garbage that God didn't intend, you know, donuts and, 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 and just loading it up with caffeine constantly and, and alcohol and you're breaking down the body, it'll affect the mind. But if the mind isn't right, it could affect the body. And it's nothing new age. I mean, you, it's scientifically proven you can get an ulcer from being stressed out. You can get high blood pressure from being stressed out. Your mind can affect your body. You know, it's like a vicious cycle that Jesus can break if your mind is right. So how do you get your mind right? Knowing who you are in Christ. I was just talking to a young girl today, and uh, she said, oh, yeah, I used to be really religious, but I was in the wrong religion. I said, well, what religion? She said, Jehovah Witness. I go, yeah, you are in the wrong religion. And she said, you know, I was born Catholic. I said, well, you need to go back to the Catholic Church. She goes, no, 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 I just, you know, I believe in, you know, just, you know, everyone's got their own path. And I said, well, you know, there's only one church. And she interrupted me and said, no, 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 there's only one God. There's many churches. I said, well, you didn't let me finish. I said, there's only one church that can historically prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was started by Jesus Christ. I said, just Google it, you know, who started the G Catholic Church and pop up Jesus every time. You know, we know who started the Jehovah Witness. It was a con artist named Charles Taze Russell, another con artist. Joseph Smith started the Mormons. And I can go down, you name any church in America, and I can tell you who the founder is pretty much. And it's a man or a woman. Only Jesus Christ started the Catholic Church. And I said, you know, you can just look at the popes. We have, you look at his, Google the popes, and you can see historically from St. Peter to Pope Francis, an unbroken chain. Every bishop has apostolic succession. So that means they can prove the guy who ordained them were ordained by a guy who was ordained by a guy all the way down to one of the apostles. I said, but not only that, we have the continuity of the teachings of the church. If you want to know what the ancient church taught, if you want to know what the apostles taught, if you want to know how church was in the first century, just look to the Catholic church. It's unbroken. I said, and when you go to the church that Jesus established, and eat his flesh and drink his blood, he'll abide in you. And you can have that peace. Because she also told me she had rheumatoid arthritis. And I know so many people that if they go to a holistic doctor, he could pinpoint the time when they got some kind of autoimmune disease. There's fibromyalgia, a rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and it's always a point when there was very st it was stress in their lives and it affected their bodies. And there's ways of reversing that naturally. But the most important thing is getting your mind right. You know, I, I told her I knew a lot of Jehovah Witnesses that were in, um, you know, mental institutions because they just went had nervous breakdowns. And she said, yeah, she knows many herself. It's a very, you know, these cults, you know. You know, God gave us the Sabbath to rest. It was for us, not for him. He, God didn't make the Sabbath for him. He made it for us to rest. And then the Pharisees just put all kinds of rules and laws on the Sabbath and made it so burdensome. And Jesus condemned them. He said, you put this yoke on your people. This burden. And that's life in general. You know, Jesus' burden is light. His yoke is easy. And religious leaders just put so much on people. And, pe and so many people put it on themselves. You have a lot of people, you know, a lot of us are just self-analytical and they just put so much on. And Jesus wants to give you peace. But the way... You get to know Jesus' peace is by knowing who you are in Christ. And there's an old story. You may have heard me say it once or twice, but I'm going to say it again because it kind of, if you can convince someone who they are in Christ, they can find joy. They can put Jesus first. They can put others first. And that's where you find the joy of Christ. So sometime in medieval times, this prostitute got arrested for prostituting herself and got thrown into this dirty dungeon with rats and roaches, and she's like, yeah, I deserve this. I'm just a dirty, rotten prostitute. And then the guard came down and said, hey, I got good news. You know, we have a kind king, and uh, he forgives you of your debt. You've been pardoned, and you're free to go. So she left. She was happy. She thanked the king and went out her way. But she did what she did because she was who she was, and she was a prostitute, so she prostituted herself again, but this time in a different kingdom. She got thrown into prison again, thrown into another dungeon. This dungeon was worse than the first. And she's like, yeah, I deserve to die in this dungeon. I probably will. But then the guard came down and told her good news again. 
she said, the king wants to free you. And she was like, oh, that's awesome. And she said, and he wants to marry you. She's like, he wants to marry me? I'm just a wretched prostitute, a sinner. He says, the king loves you. He wants to make you his bride. And that's us. We're all a wretched sinner. We all belong in that dungeon with roaches and rats. But King Jesus wants to marry us. And we're the bride of Christ. The church as a whole is the bride of Christ. And if you're married to the king, why would you do? Why would you let yourself be stuck in a dungeon? Why would you, why would you want to sin? Why would that, it would make no sense for that woman to go prostitute herself. She's married to the king. Why do we sin? You know? And we all sin. I sin. You know, I'm like, why did I do that? I'm married to the king. But the king is so gracious. He's given the church the sacrament of reconciliation. Just read uh, John chapter 20. And he's given the priests the gift of reconciliations where they can reconcile us with God. So go to confession. Make a good, honest confession to God. And then go eat that Eucharist and abide in Christ so he can abide in you. And then you can love. You can love the world the way Jesus loves the world because he'll be in you. God bless. I hope this was helpful. And uh, stay Catholic.